All right, thank you so much, Laurel. And again, welcome to the webinar and thank you very much for joining me today. Um, I am excited to be here with you, so let's get started. So like many of you, uh, I am excited about 2021 and the beginning of this new year, especially because 2020 was a very challenging year, probably for most of us, if not all. Um, you probably were impacted and are impacted by the global pandemic, the COVID-19. And because of that, a lot of uh, different industry, the overall economy was very unpredictable. Some of the industries um, got impacted very, very, uh, you know, significantly, such as say the travel industry, um, since a lot of people can not travel anymore during the lockdown. And some um, industry on the other hand, like Zoom or you know, online meetings uh, have a very high spike in, in demand during the past year. So it was very unpredictable, um, very unexpected. And at the same time, we also have shifting business landscape that's going on coupled with the accelerating digital innovation that has been going on for a while, but the <laughs> at this time it's going at a higher speed than ever before. And all the work that we are doing or have been doing in different companies for existing need to modernize the legacy platforms and practices are also still going on. So the need to move from monolithic uh, highly coupled platforms to something that's more modern, like uh, maybe more DevOps oriented, uh, more automation and so on is still a need. So that need doesn't stop, that work doesn't stop. And again, at the same time, not only that it's about your industry and uh, the competition and the shifting landscape, it's also that from the customer demand side, there is a significant drop in the demand pretty much across the board because people are being more cautious about um, their spending since they are not entirely sure what is going to happen going forward. Now with all that and probably more, it's enough for all of us to hope for a better year, right? Um, so let's start talking about from a personal perspective first. Um, you are probably already familiar with New Year's resolutions. A lot of you might even have one for this year or more. Um, a lot of people are energized to make changes in their lives at the beginning of the year. And many times it is through the lens of New Year's resolution. And just for fun, I looked up some statistics on this. And here are the four top New Year's resolution according to the survey by Inc.com. Um, the first three having to do with health, uh, more than half of the participants said that they want to eat healthier, exercise more, and lose weight. And then more than a third of the participants of, to this survey also said that they wanted to save more. So you can see that there is definitely a motivation to want to be better and make changes, positive changes in their lives. However, if you actually follow them through the year, and see the success rate going forward, it's actually not very promising, unfortunately. Um, so I'm going to pick a stats from the US. You can see that about 60% of Americans make resolutions uh, each year. However, by the end of the month, January 31st, which is in a few days, um, more than half of them will have given up. Uh, this leaves about 30% of the population still going on with their New Year's resolution. But then when you get to the end of the year by December 31st, only 8% will have made their goals. That's not a very uh, high number at all, is it? So now if you ask these people and see, uh, so what happened? You know, why didn't you meet the goal? Why didn't you stick with your New Year's resolution? what they say is usually these. It might be unrealistic goals. It might be that you know someone who, let's say, don't exercise at all uh, are making a resolution that they want to run an outer marathon you know, by the end of the year. That's probably not something that is very realistic, um, not likely that they will reach that goal at the end of the year. 
even though it is a very um, exciting thing to be daydreaming about, you know, that you'll have a, a new beginning and you'll uh, really change the way that you live or, you know, how your body looks and performs, um, it's very unlikely that you will reach that goal if you set a goal that are very um, challenging like that. Now, another thing is, usually it is very hard to track progress in the middle of uh, the year or even the middle of January, right? That's why half of the people who set the New Year's resolutions actually give up by the end of the first month. That it might be exciting, again, to think about the end, but in the middle of January, if you are trying to get up in early in the morning when it's still dark outside to try to go for a run, maybe your bed just looks very comfortable. Um, and if you don't really have a way to track progress and, and show your success along the way, it is very hard to keep motivating yourself for 365 days. And then the last four bullets here are all a symptom of life happens. Um, if you don't have any long-term plans of support uh, when unexpected things happen and you, you might end up with competing priorities and maybe your kid will get sick, maybe the roof will start leaking, maybe you'll twist your ankle. You know, things, when things like that happen and you, and you are put under stress and limited time and resources, what usually happens is that you will revert to your old habit because that's the easiest thing to do and that, that's the most um, familiar and uh, you know, safe feeling that you have. So what happens in the end is that you will feel disappointed, you know, people feel guilty about not meeting their goal again. But then at the same time, they will still repeat all this process again next year, because it is really something that they want to be able to do, you know, they want to um, feel healthier and save more money and all that. So now if we look at organizations, they also face the same challenges is a very similar uh, story when we're looking at organizations as well. Um, now organizations today on average have taken five major enterprise level changes in the last three years. And that's a lot, right? There's more than one per year. Uh, and the sad thing is that only 30, 34% of them, about one third, report successful organizational change implementation. And then maybe an even more alarming number here on the pie chart on the right hand side is that 50% of them or half report clear failure. And when you ask them, you know, the reasons why they think that the implementations didn't go as planned, the reasons are very similar to what we saw with the New Year's resolution. Um, they cite lack of tracking and they feel like they're just shooting in the dark throughout the transformation. Maybe they are doing local changes in, especially for managers and directors who are at the middle level of the organization. They make changes where they can control and they can track easily, it, but it might not align with the overall business strategy. So each department might be making their own changes that are going in different directions. And Lastly, this is the, the life happen version of the organization that you might have to be fighting fire all the time because of shifting priorities or production defects or something that comes up unexpectedly over long-term transformation. So with all that, you know, I, um, you might be asking at this point, is there a better way? What else can we do to get out of this loop? So here's what I would like to propose to you. Another different way of looking at how your transformation is going is by using value stream management. And value stream management is a relatively new practice in technology as defined by Forrester as followed. It is a combination of people, process, and technology that maps, optimizes, visualizes, and governs business value flow, including epics, stories, work items, through heterogeneous enterprise software delivery pipelines. So say more, saying it more simply is that it is uh, an end-to-end, customer-oriented 
set of activities that um, an organization has to do to deliver value to the customer. And if, if you can see here in the diagram below, you can see the gray bar uh, that is labeled Agile. And at this point, Agile practices have been popular, popularized quite a bit um, within technology world. So that is mostly focusing on the create area, right? And maybe a little bit in the ideate. So it covers mostly from um, analysis, from product manager coming up with the idea to through uh, development team coding and testing. And then within the more recent history, we started to have the rise of DevOps. Now we extend uh, from where Agile ends through release and operates activities. So now we have a more holistic view um, that is more expanded of the value stream. So now what value stream management is, or what VSM does, is that it's more end-to-end. -end. It takes Agile and Dev DevOps and extends it even further so that it covers the end-to-end -end pipeline of all the activities that an organization stations have to do to deliver value. And not only that, to add on top of the end-to-end -to -end view, um, you also want to be doing um, and applying uh, VSM in an iterative approach. So you will start by assessing your current state and then do, doing some experiments, analyzing the data, and then make adjustments. And then in the end, you want to reassess your new current state and so on. And from here, I will be talking about each of these steps one by one. So first of all, in assess current state, you want to determine where you are and where you want to be before you start your journey. So one of the lessons that my dad taught me when I was a kid was before the era of all these smartphones. Um, my dad set up the scenario of, well, if someone calls your house landline from a payphone saying, hey, how, I, how do I get to your house? what would be the first thing that you say? Well, me as a kid thinking through it, I said, well, maybe I'll describe my house, the goal, the destination. Um, my house has a blue, fr a blue fence uh, and two pomegranate trees in front of it. And my dad stopped me there and he said, well, before all that, which is great, you want to ask them, where are you? You know, where are you calling from? Where are you? Uh, so that you can give them the correct direction according to their current state. And for our transformation journey, it's the same thing. You have to know first where you are before you can start moving. And the way that you do that um, to understand the current state in the technology world is that you could use metrics and measurements. What do you know about the current state? You could use things like the financial uh, measurements like revenue generated or budget versus actual spending and see where you are. You can also look at it through the operations um, side of things and look at the de deployment frequency or application stability. How much is your application available to your end customer? Does it go down a lot? If you're taking the lens of Scrum, you can look at story points for Sprint and see if you're delivering consistently or if the rate of delivery is going up and down. Or if you're taking the lens of uh, quality, you might be looking at the number of defects, whether it's defects introduced per release or defects that are already out there in production and how severe they are. These are all good measurements, uh, but none of them is giving you the whole picture, right? So this is what I want to caution when, when you are thinking about how to measure your current state. Make sure that uh, you are using the right metric and that and is giving you the right information that you're looking for, especially uh, for pro proxy metrics, which are these metrics that are not measuring the things that you uh, most want to know, but you might be picking it because it's easier to measure. 
And what I'm what I mean by that is that it can lead to unintended results. So that's why you want to be particularly careful about using proxy metrics. Um, it does not give you the whole picture. It might not tell you what you think they're telling you. And it might even create wrong incentive for the people who are getting measured. So just to put a little bit more context and examples around these things. So for example, if you're in a call center environment, Sometimes the representatives are measured by the number of minutes that they spent per call. If they are trying to minimize the number of minutes, maybe what happens is that they will try to transfer the um, customers away from them as quickly as possible. Or maybe they'll even hang up on customers if the conversation is going on for too long. And that's not optimal from the customer's perspective. Similarly, some hospitals use the measurement of mortality rate, which means you know how, how many patients actually survive right, after being treated at the hospital. At the face value, that looks good. It looks like if the hospital does a good job, then people will have a more likelihood of surviving. However, what that might incentivize hospitals to do is to turn away difficult cases. And, and as a patient, you don't want that. You don't want to be transferred around from hospital to hospital while you're looking for your treatment. And then more from the technology perspective and, and uh, in our IT context, maybe it's the line of code that you are measuring uh, and to see how productive the developers are. But what that does is that it incentivizes people to maybe use bad coding practices. Uh, they might be copying and pasting their code instead of say using function, you know, just to give a, a very simplified um, example. And then at the same time, on top of all that, that it might be giving you the wrong incentives to people. For leaders, if you're using proxy metrics or metrics that only give you a little bit of uh, a view into how your organization is doing, it's like leading while blindfolded. You might have a lot of specialized tools and silos without end-to-end -end view. This is very, very common nowadays, especially at big companies. You might have a tool for uh, portf portfolio management space, maybe CA PPM, for example. And then when you move into development, you might use JIRA. And then when you move into um, incident management, you might have service now. And you might even have another tool for uh, quality management. And to make the matter worse, maybe you have different departments using different tools, different teams saying that you have to use their specialized uh, tool. It might even be homegrown. So it's very hard to have an end to end view of what is going on. So what people end up having to do is relying on their gut feelings instead, which is not optimal at all. And they might end up also uh, optimizing and spending money in um, the areas that they can see or the area that they are most familiar with or the low hanging fruit from their perspective. So it's not coming from a customer oriented, not customer focused view. Um, it might be that you are spending money trying to improve the process in the place that doesn't actually need it. I like this quote a lot, and I think that it really illustrates what I am just talking about just now from John Willis. He is the Senior Director of the Global Transformation Office at Red Hat, uh, Red Hat um, and he's also the co-author of the DevOps Handbook. He said, measuring only one area of the value stream is like only using two inches of the 12 inch ruler you can see for sure that this is not optimal and you're not uh, seeing the whole picture, right? So here is a suggested alternative, something, that we, something else that we can measure and something else that we can do. Um, I would like to introduce to you flow metrics. And this is a set of metrics that you can use that is end-to-end uh, -end and customer-oriented view of a product value stream. Now, it's somewhat like an equivalent of when you go to your 
doctors for an annual checkup and they take your vital signs. It is a quick look of your overall systems, you know, your body or uh, your product value stream to see if there is any obvious sign of something going on and if you need to dig further to understand and, you know, do more analysis. So instead of uh, blood pressure, pulse, and, you know, BMI, weight, and all that in your doctor's office, in terms of your pl product value stream, you have these flow metrics instead. You have flow velocity, flow efficiency, flow time, flow load, and flow distribution. And I'll be talking about each of these one by one. Starting with flow velocity. It answers the question of, is value delivery accelerating? What it measure, measures is the number of flow items delivered in a set duration. So if you look at the screenshot on the right-hand side, this is from our desktop viz product that we have. is a software that help you visualize how your flow is doing and measure all these flow metrics. But um, you can see that it has a graph over time of how per week, uh, how many items are being delivered. And this is shown from October of 2020 until January of this year. You can see it going up and down and different colors be, uh, means different types of work. So it could be feature, defect, debt, and risk. Now from here, you can see if you are delivering consistently, that is the insight that you get from this graph. Um, is the rate of delivery going up or down? Or is it fluctuating a lot? Um, do you see a lot of peaks and valleys? And if so, maybe it is something that you want to investigate further. The second metric is flow efficiency. Now, it answers the question of, is waste decreasing in our processes? It measures the ratio of active versus wait time and delivery. The important part here is that it is looking at uh, measuring efficiency from the work item perspective, not from your worker perspective. So it is very, very common for different companies to have all of their people being very, very busy, but still have a low flow efficiency. How is this possible, right? Um, they might have all the developers and testers and everyone working uh, all of their time, uh, spending all their time doing something. But however, they, uh, from the user story perspective, um, you might have uh, stories waiting for, um, you, waiting for developers to pick up the, um, the work or it might be use, waiting for approval or waiting for environment to be created. So for, this is you know, very important to note that it is from the work perspective, which is most closely related to the customer perspective. Now in terms of flow time, um, this is uh, in the attempt to answer the question of is time to market getting any shorter? It is the duration of time that it takes to deliver a flow item. And this is very important to customers, right? Um, you want to see end to end how long it takes from when the customer is requesting um, this product to be uh, created for them until they get that value delivered to them. Um, it is a good way of checking your perception versus your re the, the actual reality. Because a lot of time when you have a lot of different um, ways of measuring or different tools that are not connected, it's very hard to see the end-to-end -end version, you know, of measurement of time. So flow time is very variable that way. And again, this is also something that you can use to see how consistent or not you are delivering your work. Now for flow load, this is 
the answer to the question of, are we balancing demand versus capacity? It is the measurement of work in progress. So if you start something, do you finish it? Or does it get stuck somewhere um, within the work progress within the pipeline? This is a very good leading indicator. It's a first warning sign of whether or not something is going on. Usually if you have too much whip, it often leads to trouble because um, your team members might be overloaded cognitively. They might have to be doing a lot of context switching going from one work item to the next. And it impacts quality because anytime that you are switching context a lot, something might get missed. And it also decreased team morale because they don't get the satisfaction of finishing something as often. It's more of the um, feeling like they're racing against the clock, trying to finish something, but having to switch to something else. From the delivery point of view, it also means that they have unpredictable delivery time. You know, you don't know how long something might take to get through the whole pipeline if each time that uh, you start something, it might may or may not get interrupted halfway. If that happens a lot, and if you miss your promises um, often, then that leads to the loss of customer trust. You might have a difficulty also in sticking to your strategic plan, because if your plan changes or if your team have to um, deal with things that are coming up uh, unexpectedly often, then that's very hard to plan long term. And then the last flow metric that I want to talk about is flow distribution. So for this one, it answers the question of, are we investing in both business value generation and protection? We, it shows you what types of work are getting done. Is it feature, defect, debt, or risk? And as you can see from the right-hand uh, bar chart over here, feature is um, shown in green, defects is shown in red, debt in purple, and risk in yellow. So you can see that this is the a good and easy way of looking at how much um, effort you're, you're spending on each of these. And it depends on the context, product maturity, and your strategy to see you know, what, how much a ratio of one or the other you want to be spending on. So for example, if you are working with a new product value stream, um, you will probably see a lot more green because you are building up new features to be delivered. But once the product has been um, introduced into the marketplace and it has matured quite a bit, you probably want to see more debt and defect work getting done so that you're not just building new feature without circling back and making sure that you're updating your infrastructure, for example. So now that you uh, have assessed your current state quite a bit um, by using the flow metrics or you know, other key measurements that you use within your organization, now you want to start experimenting and try to get better. You want to work with the team to come up with some hypotheses. Where is the work getting stuck and what changes can we make to go faster? So a very important concept here around bottleneck is that you can only go as fast as a slowest spot. And this makes a lot of intuitive sense that speeding up other steps will not resolve an improvement of overall delivery time. However, this is something that uh, we usually get stuck when uh, we're thinking about actual work environment. So here is a, a fun example from my uh, recent um, holidays season this past year. So um, I am in Columbus, Ohio right now, and a lot of candy shops um, during the last holiday season were making all these uh, hot chocolate bombs. Um, and they were such a hot com commodity. 
um, thanks to social media, TikTok and all. Um, and what they are is that they are um, hot uh, chocolate shell um, that is filled inside with hot chocolate mix. And what you do is that you put that whole thing into a mug and then you pour some hot milk on it and then the shell breaks open and then you have a fun little experience with your hot chocolate. Um, but this was such a thing that everyone wanted, everyone was looking to buy one that all the um, candy shops were running out of all of this uh, pretty much the moment that they put it on the website. So as let's say a uh, candy store owner, what would you do? How would you um, improve your processes so that you can deliver more products to your customers? If you're looking at you know, the place where uh, is the most obviously there is a problem is probably on your website. You say, well, on my website is keep showing up as out of stock. Maybe I need to make my website faster. Maybe I need to make the payment transaction better so that it improves the overall um, experience of the shoppers. But doing that clearly would not solve any problem at all, right? Because the bottleneck is somewhere else. So you have to look more upstream to see if the bottleneck is actually with not having enough mode to make these shells, or is it not having enough supply of chocolate or material of like um, hot chocolate mixes, or is it not having enough people with the right skills to make these things and then you need to train your people? What is it that is the problem? So you have to, again, to understand your bottlenecks first before you um, try to solve the problem. Because if not, then you're just wasting your time, money, and energy. So a similar thing happens in software delivery that many people, a lot of leaders, and uh, sometimes even ourselves make the, the mistake of trying to solve a problem where there is none. So you might be trying to add developers um, and not thinking that it will not actually solve the problems that is caused by something else. So for example, adding more people, more developers in particular, will not solve problems that are caused by, say, testing bottleneck, not having enough ready, ready for dev work, dependencies with external teams, release approval cycle, or frequent priority changes. You can see that these things have nothing to do with um, having more developers, right? So now you probably already have a good guess of where your bottlenecks are within your value stream, but how do you confirm it with data? How do you know that, that those things are actually the right bottlenecks? So here is a um, example from Viz again. Um, here's a screenshot of one of the features that we have in Viz. It is called Find Bottlenecks and is a very quick data-driven visualization of the states where artifacts are piled up and the states that the artifacts are spending the most time. So if you see the graph on the right, the x-axis is the duration of how much time those artifacts are spending in each state. And the y-axis is uh, showing the number of artifact counts that are sitting in that particular state. So you can see that there are two dots on the top right-hand side, which is bad news because it means that those things are spending a lot of time in those states. And also there are a lot of things piling up in that states as well. So now you can look at the table down below and see what exactly are those things, right? So you see that they are both uh, user stories that are sitting in the backlog and it's way more than any other states. So that gives you a, a good starting point to go have a conversation with the team to try to understand more about what is going on. But at least it gives you a data-driven way of a starting point to say, is there something that we can do with the backlog? What is causing the pain here? Is it prioritization or do we not have enough developers now to pick it up? Another way of um, understanding bottlenecks is by looking at neglected WIP. 
This is another uh, functionality that we have within Tasktop Viz is at a glance view of how stale the work is in the pipeline. So it's shown in a uh, almost like a gas gauge in your car that the more red it is, the more stale the work is in the pipeline. That it probably means that you have outdated requests getting stuck because work is getting put on hold after it started. You might have shifting priorities or it might be showing signs of problems in the value stream. So when you start to see a lot of red, a lot of neglected whip in your pipeline, it means that it is time to dive down to see what is going on. And of course, this is the main um, measurement to um, show you the ability for your value stream to adapt to business ever-changing demands. And at this point in time, uh, you always have to adapt, right? The more agile you are, the better it is. Because um, nowadays, I think with both uh, technology innovation and the landscape, like we talked about in the beginning, um, you have the need to adapt even more. So it's good to keep your product value stream lean and uh, agile. Now, once you have selected your target bottleneck, the next thing we want to do is to experiment. You have confirmed your bottleneck with data. You select the most impactful place to start. You want to design experiments with a team. You can do brainstorming ex exercises. And then you can start implementing the activities. Try it out in a small scale. Once you have done the experiment, now you want to analyze the data. Try to compare your data against your baseline, whether it's flow metrics, or other uh, measurements that you have in place. Do they confirm your hypotheses? Do these measurements and numbers get better or worse? If it does confirm your hypotheses that um, your experiment actually improves the performance of your value stream, then great, you know, congratulations. If not, then that's also great. Um, that's a very valuable data point as well, that, okay, that doesn't work, but now you know that it doesn't work, so you don't have to repeat that again. One of my favorite quotes um, from Thomas Edison is, I have not failed. I have just found 10,000 ways that won't work. And I hope to you that you won't have to try 10,000 times on one single bottleneck. But still, that is the sentiment is the most important part here. Now that you have Analyze the data, it's time to actually implement um, your results into your long-term practices. You want to take action. Um, regardless of whether or not uh, your results confirmed or reject your hypotheses, you want to document and communicate your findings and lessons learned so that people can reap the benefits and also not having to repeat something that you know now does not work. You want to incorporate positive changes into standard procedure. So that becomes something that you can always uh, do and get the um, most optimal results from. You want to um, help celebrate and share success stories and to help drive the growth mindset and positive culture of being um, that experiment is okay and failure is not the end and not something to be punished, but to be celebrated. And then afterwards, you can decide whether you or not you want to try a different approach on the same pain point to see if you can improve it even further or if you want to focus on a new bottleneck. So now you have taken one step, you know, um, in the cycle, right? So it's one step towards a successful transformation. Uh, it's one step towards your goal. Now you do it again and again. Um, I promise you it's probably not going to be the only time you have to do this. So you have to keep going, have the framework in place and repeat it. And for sure, I can guarantee that you will find unexpected roadblocks and you have to expect to adjust. Life will happen, your compet competitor who come up with some uh, feature that you have to respond to, or the economy will do something unexpected. Um, so 
instead of thinking that your plan will go um, uninterrupted, it's better to expect to have to adjust. And how do you do that? You want to keep looking at the big picture, have a framework like value stream management lens. Um, you want to keep the end-to-end -end perspective, be customer focused always and measure what matters and keep measuring, keep experimenting, continue to learn, test, adapt and grow. Um, keep moving in the right direction. It's not a straight line um, from your uh, current state to your destination, but it's iterative. And then you have to be ready to handle any business and technical terrain changes that will come, um, whatever is coming after that bend at the end of the road. And then lastly, I want to leave you with this positive quote. Um, you keep putting one foot in front of the other, and then one day you look back and you have climbed a mountain. It might not be today that you have reached your destination. It might not be next week, next month, or even next year, but at least you are uh, moving in the right direction and you have put in place um, a support system and a, you know, a framework like value stream management and measurements that will help you move in the right direction and know that you are moving in the right direction. So where to go from now? Um, if you want to know more about flow, the Flow framework, especially from um, TaskTop, here's what we can help you with. Um, you can start to understand more about the concepts of value stream management and how to apply the flow metrics by going to um, our Flow Institute. The URL is down here, it's the flowframework.org forward slash Flow Institute. Um, there you can find on-demand on -demand courses, uh, more interactive workshops and executive roundtables. And with that, um, I would like to thank you for your time and attention and I would be happy to answer questions. Thank you so much, Panina. Uh, so the first question we have is delivery rate. How is this measured? For example, lines of code, value delivered, et cetera. Yes, that is a wonderful question and thank you for that. Um, so for delivery rate in terms of our flow framework, how we, how we measure it is the number of items and that is for the um, flow velocity metric in particular. It's you know the number of items, whether it's number of user story, number of defects that are fixed or a number of epic. So depending on what is the um, focus on what you want to uh, measure and what is most important to you from the customer perspective, those are the types of things that we want to measure is a number of those things that we deliver per uh, time. And to add on to that, if you want to drill down a little bit more, you can also use flow time to see um, how long it takes to deliver each thing. Awesome, thank mm -hmm. you. And our, our next question kind of tails on that and says, mm -hmm. can you please go into a little bit more detail on how value is defined and measured? Oh, absolutely. That is great. Um, and, and that is, um, you're already thinking about value stream uh, management from, you know, product oriented and being customer oriented. So um, I would like to congratulate you from making that mindset shift. So for each value stream, you want to start by looking at who is your customer and what do they want? What kinds of things are you um, or your organization providing to the customer? Right. So let's say if you are a um, travel agency and your customers are, you know, the people who are planning vacation, myself included, daydreaming about it, then your value is, say, it might be the um, package of travel that you are creating for them um, or like hotels that are booked and all this. So you first want to understand, again, being customer oriented, pick what um, see what your customers are and what it is in the end that you are delivering to them that they care about. So those are the values that you want to keep in mind when you're thinking about value stream management. Awesome, thank you. The yep. next question we have is what strategies can you recommend to get software teams to start adopting the full framework? 
Absolutely. So um, the flow framework in itself is almost like um, another uh, example of uh, start small and iterate, right? So you want to start with a small team that is willing and able to make changes. So you want to try to find, you know, those uh, um, innovators and people who want to try new things and are willing to be the pilot group. Um, start with those group, try to uh, learn and educate them. We can use some of our task top um, material as well. And then start with uh, you know, understanding the flow metrics, flow framework, and then start small, try to experiment and see if it change, you know, make changes in, in a good way and then repeat. And once that um, value stream has gotten to a, a point that they are a bit more mature and um, understand and, and can have success stories, then now that then you can have that value stream be your, uh, you know, promoter, your advocate, um, or your example, when you're talking about trying to explain um, value stream management to the rest of your company, you can say, here is what they did and here is how they were successful. So again, my recommendation in summary is that you want to start small, you know, experiment with a small team, right? And if it works, great, you know, like do more of that and success, uh, celebrate their, their success and make sure that people know that um, they're doing well and how they uh, can do it too. The next question we have, is does the framework apply identically to small or large organizations, meaning many value streams or dozens of release trains and thousands of tasks? Yeah. Um, yes, yes. The, the lucky um, <laughs> answer is yes. Um, you can use this to apply to basically anything. You can start from uh, a small value stream, you know, a very um, simple value stream until, you know, very large, uh, complex enterprises as well. And the flow framework is not very um, prescriptive. So you could use it to um, monitor any changes, uh, whether it's a transformation, you know, so another way of looking at it is that you can use value stream management to monitor the changes and how you're doing in different types of transformation, whether you're going from waterfall to agile or going to save or less or uh, going to DevOps, anything like that, you could use value stream management too, because really what it all is, is um, the framework and the mindset, right? It's about uh, having customer first uh, mindset and then um, making sure that you're measuring the right things and keep measuring those things as you are going along. So yes, whether or not you have like a, a small um, organization or a, a large organization, it can work. Um, it might be a little more challenging to do in a large organization and, and takes a little more time. Um, but again, you can start with a, a small team and then try to um, roll it out from there. Great. And we have a follow-up question to the past one that you answered. Yeah. And I, I understand what you said about value, but can you elaborate on how you measure it? Is it with metrics like net promoter score? Are there any ah. other stuff you typically use? Yes, absolutely. Yeah, you, you can uh, do it in in many different ways and net promoter scores is, is one of them. Um, so in terms of our values that, that we use for business results, um, some of the things that we have in the tools and you can add your own as well, but some of the things that we have are like revenue, um, cost saving, um, the net promoter scores for either uh, your end users or your um, employees as well, because that's also something you want to take care of. Um, you can also look at, you know, how fast uh, you are delivering those values. So those are all the um, metrics that, that you can use to um, see, you know, like and, and measure uh, your progress and see how you're doing. So excellent question. Thank you for the follow up. <laughs> Awesome. And the next one is, how can Biz understand that there is neglected whip in the systems? Ah, yes. Um, so that that is one of our um, 
uh, functionalities that we're, we are very proud of. But basically, in, in a simplified term, it is um, looking at the number of items that are in your pipeline, right? Um, and comparing that to the number of items that you can complete uh, per du the same duration and see um, that's the calculation, right? Let's say you can com complete five items per week, but then you have, let's say, 500 things in your pipeline. It probably means that you have some neglected WIP in your uh, pipeline. And that's a very simplified uh, answer to that. But um, it's having to do with a little slaw queuing theory um, in the background. <laughs> Does this work for other methodologies? Let's say we use waterfall. Yes. Yes, you can use this uh, with anything. You can uh, start where you are. Um, and it doesn't even have to be a transformation. You can start uh, using value stream management as a way to measure how you are doing um, today. And even if you're just making changes that are uh, small and just um, incremental, that is something that you can use as well. It's not uh, tied to any particular methodology at all. Um, it's just a different way of trying to measure and really um, widening your, your lens to see more holistically what is going on from end to end rather than looking at um, one tool you know, at a time. So yes, it does work with waterfall as well. Mm -hmm. Great. And then does this provide a method for mapping your value stream and the KPIs you're tracking associated with that value stream? Yes, we have a way to um, also include and, and track the business results. So kind of going back to the question earlier about how what the values are and, and what kind of thing can we track. Um, this also have a, an area in, in the tool to track the um, business results. So you could say uh, for revenue, you might be entering, you know, like the revenue for Q1 is this much and then plot it over time through Q2, Q3 and so on so that you can very easily see um, the correlation between your business results and what your flow metrics are doing. So, you know, like if you are delivering faster because your uh, flow time is shorter, you know, your time to market is shorter, maybe your revenue goes up as well because you are faster at delivering value. So yes, there are ways in, in Viz to also track your KPI, set goals, um, mark some timeline events. Uh, just let's say like if you are um, implementing new practices, then you can do that as well. So yes. Awesome. I think that's all we have time for today. I want to thank everyone for joining us. And Panina, thank you so much for presenting. Uh, just a reminder, if you want more information on flow metrics and uh, value stream management, uh, you can visit Flow Institute on flowframework.org um, or reach out to us with any more questions. Thank you all again and have a great rest of your day. Great. Thank you.